thank you everybody and what a lucky group of guys you are because douglas carswell is one of um the most uh, original people uh, i know and he's a great guy and you're in good hands um he's asked me to talk about why freedom matters uh, and uh, mainly i'm going to talk about it from an economic point of view uh, but i think before i do so i should say look that's not the only reason freedom matters freedom matters from a moral point of view too uh, you know it's just better to be allowed to do what you want to do and not what you don't want to do uh, i've just come back from a football match my team didn't win they drew unfortunately but um uh, nobody i didn't have to get anybody's permission to go and that's quite unusual in human history you know if you were a slave or a serf you obviously couldn't didn't get permission to to go and do do what you wanted but even if you weren't even you know you needed uh, the permission of the the ruler to leave your hometown for a lot of history you needed the permission of your family to to do things etc so permissionless behavior is quite a new thing in human history it's morally terribly important but what I'm interested in is how it drives prosperity, how without that freedom, you wouldn't have prosperity. Freedom and prosperity go together. But why? What's the link? I mean, it shouldn't necessarily be the case that, that if you're more free to do what you want, the world will become more prosperous. I think the link is innovation. And that's why I wrote a subsequent book called How Innovation Works, which uh, you can also read if, if you're uh, interested. Um, because I argue in that in innovation is the child of freedom. It doesn't happen unless people are free to do all sorts of things, to experiment, to fail, to, to, to follow their own hunches, to change their minds, all those kind of things. But it's, it's the child of freedom, but it's the parent of prosperity. Without innovation, we wouldn't have these incredible improvements in living standards that we've got today. Now, what I want to do just to kick off is to read a, a page and a half from that book that I think um, builds on what I've said in The Rational Optimist and gives you an idea of where I'm coming from. Uh, I say, the main ingredient in the secret sauce that leads to innovation is freedom. Freedom to exchange, experiment, imagine, invest, and fail. Freedom from expropriation or restriction by chiefs, priests, and thieves. Freedom on the part of consumers to reward the innovations they like and reject the ones they do not. Liberals have argued since at least the 18th century that freedom leads to prosperity, but I would argue that they have never persuasively found the mechanism, the drive chain, by which one causes the other. Innovation, the infinite improbability drive, as I call it, is the, that drive chain, that missing link. So innovation is the child of freedom because it is a free creative attempt to satisfy freely expressed human desires. Innovative societies are free societies, where people are free to express their wishes and seek the satisfaction of those wishes, and where creative minds are free to experiment to find ways to supply those requests, so long as they do not harm others. I do not mean freedom in some extreme libertarian lawless sense, just the general idea that if something has not been specifically prohibited, then the assumption should be that it must be allowed. A surprisingly rare phenomenon today in a world where governments try to dictate what you can do as well as what you cannot. This reliance on freedom explains why innovation cannot easily be planned, because neither human wishes nor the means of their satisfaction are easy to anticipate in the detail required. Why innovation nonetheless seems inevitable in retrospect, because the link between desire and satisfaction is only then manifest. Why innovation is a collective and collaborative business because one mind knows too little about other minds. Why innovation is organic because it must be a response to an authentic and free desire, not what somebody in authority thinks we should want. And why nobody really knows how to cause innovation because no one can make people want something. So um, I'm, I'm arguing there that it's it's freedom that leads to prosperity through innovation uh, and let me just remind you of some of the numbers that i cite in the rational optimist but that was uh, 14 years ago and a lot of people say to me today okay you wrote a book saying things are getting better for most people you can't possibly still believe that today look at the state of the world i get that comment very frequently 
And I say, no, I'm just as optimistic about the state of the world as I was then. I may be a little bit less optimistic about the state of Britain and America uh, and a few other countries, but I'm even more optimistic about the state of Africa than I was in that book, for example. And a lot more people live in Africa than in uh, Britain and America. Um, uh, so, you know, just think about the fact that in my lifetime, I'm 66 years old, I'm terribly old. Uh, when I was young, more than half the world's population lived uh, in extreme poverty, defined as less than $2 a day in 2009 dollars. Um, that's an unbelievably low level of living standards. More than half the world lived like that. Today, that number is about 8%. So nobody has ever lived through a transformation of human living standards equivalent to that. Child mortality is down by two thirds in my lifetime. Again, that's the greatest measure of misery anybody can think of, having to bury a child. I can't think of anything worse. And fewer and fewer people have to do that around the world. Uh, lifespan has increased in my lifetime at the rate of five hours per day. Every day that I live, the average human lifespan has increased by five hours. That's an unbelievable thought when you think about it. If it increased by 24 hours, we'd live forever, of course, but that hasn't happened and I don't think it will. I think we're actually going to see lifespan uh, level out at something like 90 years or 100 years, perhaps, but not much higher than that. Um, uh, but so these are extraordinary changes. And as I say, they're completely unprecedented. No previous generation saw changes on this scale. Uh, people are not only wealthier, but they're healthier, happier, cleverer, kinder, freer, more peaceful, and more equal. Um, people often say, yes, but inequality is increasing. No, it's not. Globally, inequality is declining rapidly because people in poor countries are getting rich much faster than people in rich countries. And, you know, let me come to Africa, because when I wrote The Rational Optimist, it was still possible to say and I take on this point in the book, and one reviewer really took me to task for, for this and said that I was uh, writing off Africa. Um, I wasn't, but I was, a, I was challenging the view that you commonly heard that Africa could never experience the kinds of economic growth and prosperity that Asia had just experienced, the kinds of change. Um, that was quite a common view, that it would remain mired in the deepest, darkest poverty, as one environmentalist said. Um, because of population growth, because of environmental issues, because of disease, etc. Well, actually, these the last 14 years have been really good for Africa. Um, they've not been great, as I say, in America or Britain or somewhere like that, but they've been fantastic in Africa. The AIDS epidemic, which was raging 15 years ago, is in sharp retreat. The malaria death toll has halved uh, in this century. Uh, from it was going up until about the till the early 2000s it's now going down rapidly uh, warfare in africa has shrank dramatically there were a lot of wars in africa um, for a long time for most of my life there are very few now and they're much smaller than they were um, child mortality is down uh, prosperity is up etc cetera, etc cetera. it's a great time to be an african that Hang on, I shouldn't really say that because it could get taken out of context. Of course, it's not a great time for many, many people in many of these countries. There is still far too much poverty. And one of the things I have to always guard against is people saying, ah, you're, an, you're a rational optimist. You think the world's great. It's fine. It can't get any better. There's no point. In, uh, that's really ridiculous because there's lots of things wrong with the world. Well, there are lots of things wrong with the world. The reason I'm an optimist is because I think this is nothing to what we can achieve in your lifetimes and your children's lifetimes. I think by the time your children are old people, uh, we will look back on the 2020s as a time of terrible misery and poverty for far too many people, just as we look back today on the 1950s as a time of terrible misery and poverty for far too many people. Now, I want to just touch on the role of freedom here in a little more uh, detail and give three examples of how um, freedom has interacted with prosperity uh, positively or negatively uh, it, sorry with innovation um, positively or negatively in order to create or prevent prosperity emerging um, the first is cellular telephone telephony um, in my book, 
about how innovation works. Uh, I, I cite the work of Tom Hazlitt, who did a fascinating study of uh, the way in which cellular te telephones could have come into existence 30 or 40 years before they did. There are quotes from uh, telecom executives from the 1950s and 60s saying, if we set up radios to communicate in cells, we can carry much more information than if we just have them um, going point to point. You know, they go to base stations, then they, they use the, the ground to get to another base station, then they transmit to another uh, radio. That's the basis of cellular telephony. What stopped it happening? Well, I tell you what stopped it happening was because television was squatting on the spectrum. Television was occupying an enormous chunk of the spectrum and was allowed to do so by government, um, uh, which had granted most of the spectrum to television. And television wasn't using much of that spectrum. Um, and this suited the companies that were building radio communication devices fine because they had nice little cozy monopolies. And it suited companies like AT&T fine because they had big monopolies on landlines. So they didn't want to challenge this with, with mobile telephony. It was even worse in other countries in Europe where uh, there was an assumption that telephony was a monopoly. It should be a nationalized industry. There was no interest in innovation. So there really was a prevent preventing of innovation that could have brought immense benefits to um, many, many people um, uh, by uh, government restrictions, by lack of freedom to innovate, to be entrepreneurial in that space. And by the way, when mobile phones first came into existence, and you are all too young to remember that, but I remember it, and it, it took us all somewhat by surprise, um, uh, most people said this is a toy for the rich. This is not going to help the poor. And they could not have been more wrong. It turned out very quickly that particularly in Africa, um, people were going to use this mobile telephony to uh, put themselves in the market for jobs and opportunities. Because even, you know, you couldn't get a landline in, in most of sub-Saharan Africa, but you could buy a mobile. And then they invented mobile banking, which was, an, again, immensely helpful to young people. So that's an example of government getting in the way of the freedom that required to generate the prosperity that benefits poor people. But government doesn't always get it wrong. And there, it's very important, I think, occasionally to notice examples of where uh, government has done something, has stepped into a market to liberate a market and has resulted in a, a huge improvement in people's lives. Um, and for me, the clearest example of that is the 1997 Framework for Global e Electronic Commerce, which was a bipartisan effort in the United States between the Clinton administration and a Republican Congress, and which, which is an extraordinarily libertarian document. It basically says, how are we going to liberate e-commerce? How are we going to remove the restrictions, the hurdles, the things that are in the way of people using the internet to buy and sell goods? Uh, and it, 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 I won't go into the details of how it works, but it, it really did kickstart the whole thing. Uh, and it allowed entrepreneurs like particularly Jeff Bezos and the eBay guys and uh, various others to get going in this space and to transform the way we do business with each other. Um, uh, and it was a genuinely sort of freedom um, uh, introducing piece of legislation. So it can be done. And I think that's an interesting point that you might like to think about. The third example I want to mention is China. When I wrote The Rational Optimist, China was booming. Uh, it was doing incredibly well. It's doing less well today, and I think there are good reasons for that. I'll come back to them. Um, uh, but when I wrote How Innovation Works, I had to tackle the point that here was a country doing spectacularly well at innovation and at prosperity, which was run by a communist regime with zero um, interest in the freedom of its citizens. Surely that undermines my whole argument. Uh, and uh, it doesn't, 
Because if you look at what happened in China in around 1978, it is an entirely liberating phenomenon that kick-started the great burst of Chinese prosperity. Um, before 1978, Mao Zedong was a terrible despot and tyrant who murdered far too many of his own citizens and behaved in abominable ways in suppressing the freedom of individuals to do things and suppressing the living standards. After he died, there was a battle between his heirs, his family and others. Uh, but eventually, the person who came out on top, Deng Xiaoping, was a realist and a pragmatist. He wasn't a particularly nice guy, and he suppressed uh, protests at Tiananmen Square in 1989 in a brutal way, so that he wasn't interested in allowing political freedom, and there still isn't any political freedom in China. But almost by accident, he allowed economic freedom. In 1979, no, in 1978, in a village in China called Zhao Gang, 18 farm workers held a secret meeting uh, in uh, the attic of a house. Uh, they, it had to be secret. They would be severely punished if they were found to have met voluntarily without permission. Um, and one of them, Yen Jing Chang, spoke up and said, look, this collective farm we all work for is a disaster. Um, we can't produce enough food. When we do, it's confiscated. None of us have any incentive to work any harder. Um, uh, conditions are dreadful. Wouldn't it be better if each of us had a little plot of land over in the corner somewhere and grew some food on that? Um, uh, we can go on pretending to work on the collective farm in the daytime, but in the evening and the early morning, we can go off and work on our plot. And they drew up a secret contract to do this, uh, rolled it up and put it inside a bamboo um, tube and hid it in the rafters. Um, the local uh, head of the collective farm found out what they were doing, demanded they be punished for it, uh, but the local party chief stepped in and said, no, actually, you know, I'd noticed they are suddenly producing a whole, whole lot more food, that something like five times as much food as they had produced in the previous year uh, within the next year. Um, maybe this experiment is worth tolerating. And that experiment was then heard about by Deng Xiaoping in Beijing. And it was recommended to him that he suppress it. And he said, no, let's let it happen and see what happens. And soon villages all over China were emulating this. Effectively, it was a privatization of agriculture that was going on. And the point is that Deng Xiaoping didn't uh, introduced the freedom, he tolerated the freedom, he let it emerge. Uh, and then what happened, it spread to other industries, uh, manufacturing services, everything. And what happened was that effectively, a Chinese entrepreneur was more free than an American entrepreneur um, to do what the heck he wanted. Um, suddenly, you know, there were no barriers in the way because unlike an american entrepreneur he didn't need sort of zoning permission he didn't need occupational licensing you know if he wanted to set up a hairdresser he didn't have to get the qualifications to be a hairdresser he could just do it uh, you could get off the ground much quicker in china as an entrepreneur um, there were many fewer bureaucrats and beadles and regulators in the way of you doing what you wanted to do so i argue that China was actually extremely free for about 30 years after 1980, economically, not politically, but economically. And that's where its prosperity came from. Now, uh, a nasty piece of work then got into power as general secretary and president. Um, uh, 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 so I've suddenly forgot his name, the, the guy who's in charge now, Xi Jinping, sorry. <laughs> um, and he has gone down a completely different track. He is trying to dictate what people can do, when they can do it, and where they can do it, economically as well as politically. He is withdrawing Deng Xiaoping's tolerance of freedom. And you are seeing it in the statistics, uh, in the failure of the country to grow, in the, uh, the debt, the uh, bankruptcies, uh, and the 
uh, general dissatisfaction that is happening uh, all over China. He is killing the goose that laid the golden eggs. Now, he's replaying, in my view, an incident uh, 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 in, in much faster terms, something that happened in China a very long time ago. China's moment of greatest prosperity in the past was under the Song dynasty, which was about a thousand years ago. And that's when it became immensely inventive uh, compared with the West, inventing things like the printing press, compass, gunpowder, all those kind of things, uh, and became really very prosperous and was probably the by far the most prosperous and interesting civilization of the day. Uh, but the Song dynasty wasn't really an empire. It wasn't centralized. It was a sort of confederation of city-states, in effect. Most government was run by merchants. Um, it was very much a sort of bottom-up, emergent sort of government. There was then a Mongol invasion which destroyed everything, and the dynasty that followed, the Ming dynasty, was quite different. It was very centralized, very bureaucratic. Uh, it, a merchant had to get permission from a bureaucrat to leave his home village to buy or sell. I mean, how can that be remotely compatible with, with, with economic growth? And sure enough, China stagnated, became immensely poor again, uh, and destroyed itself. So I'm saying that Deng Xiaoping to Xi Jinping is replaying that sort of mistake. Um, and I would quote... Uh, William Easterly on, on what Deng Xiaoping was doing, he said, the moral of this story is that autocrats get too much credit for episodes of increased economic freedom. So people who tell you today, China got rich by having the Communist Party in charge and directing an industrial policy, I think they're wrong. I think they're exactly wrong. Um, so let me end at that point.